ಗಂಗನಾಧಿಪತೇ ನಮಃ ನಮಸ್ತೆ so now we are done with the introductory material and verses and we're going to go into the text of the book itself <laughs> why am i laughing well i i hope you got your rubber ducky because we're going in the deep end of the pool <laughs> murugunar doesn't mess around okay so uh we're going to plunge right into the first chapter of the first section the first section is called analysis of the truth and the first chapter is the reality of the world as cause alone is seen as its effect and since consciousness brahman which is the cause is as clearly true as an amalaka fruit on one's palm its effect this vast universe which is described in the scriptures as mere names and forms may also be called true <laughs> you ready for this first thing in the morning <laughs> okay let's unpack this all right because this is a very deep complex philosophical statement being used as the premise for the entire work okay remember back in uladu narpadu the opening words of the very first verse are because we see the world because we see the world indicates or any topic about the world the reality of the world or the unreality of the world or whatever anything to do with the world cannot be part of ajatta vada ajatta means the view that the world doesn't exist at all so we must be on the platform of vivarta vada This is very important and this is why I spent so much time going over the different philosophical distinctions between these platforms okay in a jatavada there is no consideration of the world it's like world what world <laughs> mind what mind you know but in uh vivartavada we have to consider the world because we're not yet fully self-realized and we still perceive the world and the world still affects us so that means we have to continue performing sadhana until we get to the ajatta platform we're not done yet okay so the first consideration on the vartavada platform is is the world real or is it not <laughs> duality so here he says something which is uh, obvious to the philosophically inclined person but not at all to the average person he says the cause is visible in its effect this is a very common vedic understanding which you'll find in so many different scriptures but in western philosophy it's not so well understood uh they obfuscated on purpose <laughs> because it would blow up their whole theory about the world <laughs> whatever for example i cause let's say i'm a musician right so i make a recording so whatever is in that recording whatever music is in there it comes from me that means that potential at least for that music is in me and it becomes visible as the cause when it's in me it's virtual it hasn't been manifest uh, but when it comes out as the effect then you can hear it uh, and you say oh that music was inside you <laughs> and similarly the world is an effect it's not a cause 
What is it the effect of Brahman? So the nature and qualities of Brahman manifest in the creation, in the world. Just as the, the nature and qualities of me as a composer manifest in my music. Just as the nature and qualities of the ocean manifest in the wave. We can see the wave, we can't see the whole ocean. Uh, and if we sample the wave, we find out that every drop of water has similar qualities, wetness, saltiness, and so on. So because the taste of the material world is similar to the taste of Brahman, consciousness, we can understand that Brahman is the cause. Is that clear? If it's not, write me a question in the comments and I'll explain further. So I'm going to move on now <laughs> to the next point. And the next point is that consciousness as the cause of the world is as clear as an amalaki fruit, which is like a little, a little berry, huh? like a cherry, about the size of a cherry that grows on a tree. It's a sweet and sour fruit. It's very nice for digestion. <laughs> and it's known all over India and especially in South India. So an amalaki fruit is a dark red. No? Very easily visible on your palm. And very easily contained in the palm as well. So in the same way, like the amalaki fruit is visible, consciousness is the cause of the world. Now, all you Western linear dualistic thinkers are going to argue with me. <laughs> like the scientists, huh? Let's take it back to the, to the root of the misunderstanding. The scientists want to have an objective world. Why is that? So they can eliminate all this woo-woo stuff like consciousness. <laughs> so they don't have to look into themselves. They can only look out at the world and draw some kind of conclusions. Well, that's about as dumb as a, as a $3 bill uh, at the bank, you know? Because when you are unconscious, there is no world. For example, every night when you go to sleep, huh? when you go to sleep, where's the world? When you're dreaming, there's another world where all kinds of weird stuff happens. But in deep sleep, there's no world at all. No consciousness either. Only awareness. Non-dual, unconditioned awareness of Brahman. That's the substrate. That's the foundation. And everything else is built on that consciousness. If it... If you're not conscious of it, as far as you're concerned, it doesn't exist. Isn't it? Why do people say ignorance is bliss? Because it means that if I don't know about it, I don't have to worry about it. <laughs> of course, that's not true. But uh, people want to take shelter of this uh, stupid mentality. Then, because it allows them to, to live an easy life of laziness and stupidity. Of course, they have to pay for it later, but that's another story. Anyone who observes, simply observes their own experience, knows that the world comes into existence with what we call waking consciousness. Remember, three states, waking, dreaming, and sleep. In waking consciousness, there's the world. In dreaming consciousness, there's a world which 
may or may not be uh, similar to the real world, so-called real world. And in deep sleep, there's no world at all. So what are we doing here? <laughs> by trying to understand the world, by looking out at it, when the cause of the world is within. Duh! You see, the, the whole Western civilization has gone down the wrong road for thousands of years now. But Eastern civilization remains focused on the real cause, which is consciousness. We all have it. We all use it to create the world and this body and this life and all the stuff that we go through. Okay? But we don't want to know about it. <laughs> because then what? We have to take responsibility for it. We'd have to stop doing all our nonsense and sit down and look into ourselves and figure all this stuff out. And nothing in our experience so far, unless we happen to have a real guru, has prepared us for this. So we feel very embarrassed. We feel very awkward. Oh my God, you know, here's, here's this whole world and we were looking at it the wrong way. You know, like, like a telescope. If you take a telescope and turn it around and look through it the wrong way, well, you'll see all kinds of far out stuff, but none of it is real. So similarly, if we take the cause and effect of the consciousness and the world, and we turn it around and say, the world is the cause of consciousness. Are we going to get anywhere? No. And so the scientists have become stuck in simply producing effects. Huh? Like, like this, this phone. <laughs> or the computer that you're watching this on. Huh? It's a great effect, right? Wow, cool. But is it profound? Is it deep? Does it actually change your life? No. Whereas the simple insight that, oh my God, the world comes from consciousness, changes everything. Okay, so if we accept that cause is seen in its effect and the cause of the world is consciousness, then <laughs> if we see the world as a function of consciousness instead of the other way around, that means if we change our consciousness, we can change the world. This is huge. If we get it. So when we start to work with consciousness, we come up with the possibility that, wait a minute, maybe, maybe the world is actually true. It's just an appearance because it comes and goes. But because it's based on consciousness, it has a certain reality. Okay. And I'm running out of time already. So I can see this is going to be a slower journey than maybe what I had conceived of it. Because I understand, you know, where most of my audience is coming from. You have not been schooled in the basics. Everybody wants to jump up and meditate and realize all kinds of things and this and that. But wait a minute. <laughs> Who are you and what is this world? Those questions have to be answered first. Then we can worry about, you know, who did what to who and, and uh, what the, what's the score in the bottom of the ninth and you know all that can come later that's a detail what we have to know now is who are we what are we and what is this world we find ourselves in that's the subject of this first chapter Om Tat Sat Om Harihi Om